Grace and peace to you in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Here we are, another parable, everybody, because we're in Luke. There's so many parables. And the parable today that we have from Jesus is rather short. It's actually only four verses of the whole text, and it only includes the two characters. We have the judge and we have the widow. And we um, also, unlike many parables, have an interpretation. Luke gives us an interpretation from Jesus. Jesus says before telling the parable that the parable is about to pray always and to not lose heart. And then at the very end, Jesus mentions that God will give justice ultimately. So we have interpretation here too. So the parable seems pretty tidy as parables go. It's brief, there's two characters and interpretation. But whenever we feel like that, we should resist that kind of tidiness a little bit in a parable. Because remember, parables are meant to pack a punch. That's what Jesus is doing by using these everyday examples from living our lives in the world. So by pack a punch, I mean, we should really say to ourselves, find a place in the story to say, wait, what? Wait, what just happened? Hopefully that might help a little bit. Like in the prodigal son, which I know is a favorite of so many people, that, that parable Jesus tells in Luke, where we hear that story of a, of a son who before his father has even died, takes the inheritance and runs off and then blows it on some questionable life choices and comes back and the father is there waiting for him. That's a wait what kind of moment, right? Wait, what? What is this God of ours like, like this father? So where's our wait what moment here? The tidiness of this parable might leave us feeling like that's not there. And so maybe we've got to look a little bit harder. To get to the wait what, I think, we need to first be a little honest that the parable isn't quite as tidy as we might like it to be. There are a lot of unknowns, actually, in this parable. We don't know a whole lot about the characters or their motivations, really, in the parable. Jesus gives us very few details about the widow and the judge, very few. We know that the widow keeps on coming back to him, saying, grant me, grant me justice. But we don't know what the injustice is that she's suffered. We don't, we don't know that. Of course, as you can imagine, biblical scholars love to play with this and love to think, well, what could she be talking about here? Some people point out that it could be a property dispute. That maybe her son or her uh, husband has recently died and there's some sort of property dispute and she's there to, to really push her side of the story. That could be it. We don't know, maybe. And we really don't know what kind of thing she's asking the judge for. What exactly is the justice she's asking for? Is it for the property? Perhaps, if that's the dispute. Is it that she's asking for someone to be punished? Maybe, maybe she is, we don't know. We also don't know her socioeconomic status, really. Yes, widows, widows had a hard go of it. Many did at that time and still do certainly in a patriarchal system. But not every widow was poor in those times either. So we don't even have a clear vision of exactly who she was and where she was from. And if we're honest, we don't know much about the judge either. Certainly, he doesn't seem to be cast in a super great light. Um, you know, we hear this twice. This judge neither feared God nor respected people. Mm, that's problematic. Sure, that's problematic. Um, so he seems to lack a certain compassion about him. And it, maybe he's pretty egotistical in that he doesn't fear God. But... You know, if you look at two sides of the story, it could be that he's just a stickler with regard to the law. There are judges like that. They read the letter of the law as it's written and don't bring in outside forces for interpretation. So was he a bad judge? I don't know. Maybe he was a stickler. Again, we've got a firm maybe. A firm maybe. So we just don't know a lot about the characters here. Now, I think it's totally justified, speaking of justice and injustice, it's totally justified to say, Vicar, thank you very much for telling me all those things we don't know. That's really great. <laughs> yeah, well, why are we talking about that? It's because to concentrate on the things we do know, 
to get to that wait what part of this parable. What do we know here? We don't know about the characters, their motivations, but we do know about the time that we find this widow in. What kind of time it was for her. It was a time in between. It was a time between having suffered an injustice and the resolution to that injustice. We don't know what the injustice was, and we don't know what her resolution in her own mind was and what she was asking for, but we know she was in between those things somewhere. On a, if you've got a linear line, something happened, resolution is here, and she's in the thick of it. So that's what Jesus, that's what we know, that we're in the time in between. The time we find the widow in, this time in between, should lead us to thinking about the times in between in which we find ourselves in our own lives. A time in between a hardship occurring, I guess from your vantage point, maybe I would do it here, a hardship occurring and that resolution to that hardship. Maybe the hardship is like the widow, an injustice an unfairness, an inequity in the world. Maybe it's a loss of a loved one. Maybe it's the loss of ability due to illness or injury, the loss of a relationship. Maybe the loss of expectation, having a vision of what our life might look like and not, just not having it be the case. Whatever the initiating hardship is, we find ourselves in a time in between very often in our lives, I think. A time in between where the loss, if it's a loss, still stings, where the injustice stings, where there is hurt, when something is not righted, when there is no resolution and it's somewhere way out there. It's a hard place to be, that time in between. It's a place that can suck the energy from you, can't it? It sucks, sucks the energy from you like a vacuum, I think. Or it has you on your back heels. That's the image I had, it has you on your back heels. So I know we have some tennis players among us here and in tennis, there's a place on the court between the baseline, which is the end line, right? where people serve from, and the service line. The service line comes between the baseline and the net. So that space between the baseline and the service line is referred to as no man's land. You're in between the baseline where you could hit a wicked, a wicked forehand or backhand, whatever is your good stroke. And you're between that baseline and you're between the, the service line up near the net where you could hit a really powerful volley. But when you get caught in that no man's land on the court, it's very difficult to rip a baseliner, you can't, or to hit a volley, you're too far from the net. You're kind of incapacitated, you're back on your heels. I thought of this because I think that's a pretty good way to describe how sometimes the time in between, we get in a no man's land in these times in between in our lives. It's what being in between can feel like. It can feel like a no man's land and you feel paralyzed. And yet we have this picture of a widow who's in no man's land, who is anything but incapacitated, anything but back on her heels, anything but feeling a paralysis in action because she keeps asking. She's active. She goes to the judge. And, and in this time between, that's what, that's the where's the wait what here. The wait what comes with what is she doing in the time in between? Wait what? She badgers the judge. A badger, and I think in our, in our English translation, it's really hard to get a sense for the, the full intensity of the badgering she's doing here. In verse five, if you look at your bulletins, the judge said that because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so she will not wear me out. That phrase, wear me out, 
that phrase um, that it's been translated wear me out, but in the Greek, it's actually a boxing term, a term to be used in fisticuffs, boxing. So it could be translated as beat me up. So she won't beat me up. So she won't strike me on the face is another one. Or here's another one I, I saw, give me a black eye. I'm gonna grant her justice so she doesn't give me a black eye. Uh, persistence is a mild way of saying what, tena tenacity is a mild way of saying what this widow did in terms of bringing her requests to the judge. Now that's something, whether the judge is being literal, he was really afraid that this was happening or it was some sort of a bruise to his ego, his reputation that she was, that she was bringing on, we don't know. But this kind of hyperbole is meant to get our attention and to get to the intensity of how we are to come to God in the times in between. If the widow in the time in between can go and so intensely bother the judge that he's concerned about a black eye, whether literal or metaphorical, how much more are we supposed to go to God like that in our times in between? And get this, there is always a time in between in our lives, everybody. Like there is never a time in our lives and we are not in between something that is wrong and something in a way that has to be righted, even if we don't know what that right thing is. Our times when we experience unfairness or loss, sadness, inequity, and when there's no resolution, those are the times for intense going to God in prayer, intense crying out to God. And Jesus is telling us to do it. Maybe that's the wait what too. Wait, what is Jesus telling us to do? Come to him like the widow. The widow shows us not to be incapacitated and not to be paralyzed by that time in between, between, but to be active and deliberate, to keep on coming, keep on coming to God in that prayer. And it, as we talked about with the boys at, at our children's sermon, our Psalms are really full of this kind of keeping on coming. I'm sure some of you can point to some Psalms where like the Psalmist is just so deliberate and will not back down in the face of what he's, he or she is facing. Psalm 40 is a, is a favorite of mine. And here are some verses from Psalm 40. Listen to the, this is badgering. This is, I won't back down, God. Do not withhold your mercy from me, O Lord. May your love and truth always protect me. For troubles without number surround me. And my sins have overtaken me. I cannot see. They are more than the hairs on my head and my heart fails within me. Yet I am poor and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my help. It's a demand. You are my help. It's a trust and my deliverer. Oh God, do not delay. Oh God, do not delay. It's intense. It's a cry to God for resolution and for deliverance. And that the speaker is set on presenting it to God day in and day out. There's a tenacity to that language. As I was thinking, I've actually um, inadvertently, I used this uh, just a couple seconds ago, this phrase won't back down. Some of you like me are children of the 80s or have children yourselves of the 80s. And um, there's uh, Tom Petty is a wonderful songwriter and you don't have to be a child of the 80s to know the song, I won't back down. It's used a lot, it's been used um, it's kind of a rallying cry and it's it's people love this song i won't back down i looked into the background of it a little bit and uh, he wrote that song in the late 80s after he had suffered some a string of hardships including his house was actually burnt down by an arsonist and he wrote this after that happened where he wasn't quite sure what what lay in front of him and you might know it, but the, the, some of the lyrics are like this. I won't back down. I won't back down. You could stand me up at the gates of hell, but I won't back down. I know what's right. I just got just one life in a world that keeps on pushing me around, but I'll stand my ground and I won't back down. Those lyrics came to my head. And if you want, you can Google him and, and just play it for, for yourself when you get home. 
it seems to me that's kind of a modern version of what we've got here. You can hear the widow saying this. Hey, judge, yeah, I'm not, I won't back down. See you tomorrow. I'll see you tomorrow. Same time, same place. That's what we're being invited to do, to come to God and say, I am here. And this world keeps on dragging me down. And I don't know exactly where it's going to lead. But please listen to me. And in that prayer, the, there's another Wait, what? If, if a judge can listen to this insistent widow, how much more will our loving, loving God listen and attend to us? That's the wait, what, I think. The wait, what, another one might be, wait, what? God wants to walk with us in our times in between. And the resounding answer is yes. In the name of Christ, amen.